Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Um, let us uh, begin with a silent prayer. Okay, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to continue the series that we were doing and <clears throat> at the um, end of our last presentation we uh, were looking at the, our reform line in our time from 1989 down to this final waymark here which was the closed door uh, paralleled with Millerite history based upon the parable of the ten virgins but we haven't got a we haven't sort of called this waymark anything yet, and that's what we're going to deal with today. But ultimately, in the, in the presentation here, you can see that it's a parallel to Christ's line from his birth, the marking where John is raised up, the baptism, marriage at Cana, first temple cleansing, the triumphal entry, which parallels the midnight cry, and the second temple cleansing, which was the Passover, and marks the cross, and the close of probation, paralleling the close of probation in Millerite history. So... I, we were premising that all these reform lines are all pointing to the end of the world. So this reform line is just a repeat of Millerite history and all those past histories all brought together and we have to go through the, the, all the principles and the experiences that the Millerites went through even if it's only in a small measure so that we can see those events taking place because on October 22nd, 1844, time is no longer. So it's a repeat of events, the seven thunders, a delineation of events leading down to the close of probation, right? And telling us that we are just before the midnight cry, and then it will lead down to the closed door here uh, sometime in the near future. Once this line has been complete, now all the types are complete, it can point forward to the to the anti-type, right? And in, in Mo, the line of Moses, we have these two pharaohs, and I've marked them here at the bottom, and I want us to understand that they mark uh, two Sunday laws, but really it's only one Sunday law, but I, I want us to understand that there's a break between these two Sunday laws, and we will see why that is, and we will hopefully, by God's grace, get through this and understand and how this all these past lines, including our line, are illustrated in this line at the bottom here in some time in the near future. Okay, so anyway, let us begin. Um, now we're going to begin with some principles from Romans 1 and verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Then it says, To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And the Greek is just another term for the Gentiles, right? So the gospel is to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And I explained this, that God wants to raise up a people that are true Jews, that have been circumcised inwardly in their hearts, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, to go to the Gentiles. And he wants to do this to his church first. And therefore, he has to separate out of his church all the tales. Therefore, when we read, uh, read on, it says in Romans 2 and verse 9, it just confirms this thought. It says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So if you do evil, it comes to the Jew first because they're going to be judged first. But glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. So whether you do good or whether you do evil, you will suffer the same punishment. But it comes to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Because the Jews are the ones that already proclaim to have the light. 
The Gentiles don't have the light. You can't be judged on what you don't understand. But it says in 1 Peter 4 verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. For if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So just take this principle, the Jew first and also the Gentile. So what I want us to understand is that Jew, uh, Jew is somebody that claims to be a, a Christian and specifically the Seventh-day Adventist church. That's the church with the most light, the church that claims to walk in all the commandments of God and waiting for the advent of Christ. It is modern day Israel, right? Spiritual Jews. First comes the natural, the literal Jewish nation followed by the spiritual. The Seventh-day Adventist church was raised up in the United States of America. They were given a land, just like the Jews were given a land to preach according to the dictates of their conscience. So, um, when I say that the, the, the Jew first, I'm talking about God's church. So what I want us to understand is that the Sunday law is how God is going to judge. He's going to bring that Sunday law upon his people to prove whether you're really a Christian or not. Do you really believe God's commandments? Do you really trust in him? Are you prepared to go to the cross to uphold his truth? And he's going to test his people. And as we go through these studies, we will see that more and more. It's going to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, right? So, so basically the first Sunday law, judgment begins at the house of God. First Sunday law is going to test his church. Second Sunday law is going to test the Gentiles, right? And that, like I said, it's just one Sunday law, but there is a, a break between it. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. So this is what I want to get us to see what's going to happen at the end of the world. But I put Christ's line on here because in Christ's line, right, which was the first coming of Christ, typifying the second coming, gives us all the, um, the there's, there's a lot of deep illustrations there that are pointed to our times that have to be repeated. Christ says, pick up your cross and follow me. Christ is our example in all things. Christ meaning the anointed one is typifying his people at the end of the world who are going to be anointed, baptized by the Holy Spirit, and be like him. So he is an illustration of his people. They are to follow him and be like him through his grace, right? So, therefore, um, I've, I've placed on here uh, uh, Christ's line. Now, in that time, the time of Christ, they all began with a single messenger, John. And this is what we are showing every way mark here in this time period, from here the time of the end, next minute, after the increase of knowledge, you have a messenger that's raised up. Moses, Daniel, John, Miller, etc., etc. Right? And so in our time, right, we, we had a messenger raised up here in 1996. And that messenger was used to then bring about a movement. And this is what Christ did, right? So John preached, right? Christ got baptized, and then he began to raise up a movement, okay? So what I want us to understand is, first of all, it begins with a messenger, and then he raises up a movement, and then brings them to a test. Once the test is complete, he now has his movement, right? The next thing that you see is that this movement that he raises up goes to the church. That's where they went to the Jews. And then from there, they went to the Gentiles. So you have these four steps. And this is what I want us to see. Messenger, movement, and, 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 and I will explain it as we go through how we get down on to these lights. But that's... That's the order that we see in the line of Christ. So messenger, movement, church, Gentiles, in, in, in that order, right? And that's what we're going to, to look up here. So in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Behold. 
and, and so in Malachi 4 and verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah is his messenger which he raises up. And when the messenger is raised up, the messenger is then responsible for raising up the movement, right? So we see this in the Millerite history in early writings 2.33. Thousands were led to embrace the truth preached by William Miller, and servants of God were raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the message. So what you have here, thousands represent a group of people. They embraced the truth preached by William Miller. William Miller was a type of Elijah. And they were raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the message. So from Miller, you had all these thousands of people. Like John, the forerunner of Jesus, those, those these, these people who preached this solemn message felt compelled to lay the axe at the root of the tree and call upon men to bring forth fruits meat for repentance. Their testimony was calculated to arouse and powerfully affect the churches. So it went messenger, movement, churches, and manifest their real character and as the solemn warning to flee from the wrath to come was sounded many who were united with the churches received the healing message they saw their backslidings and with bitter tears of repentance and deep agony of soul humbled themselves before god and as the spirit of god rested upon them they helped to sound the cry fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come in the millerite history they then went on to the Gentiles. So you have the exact same order. Messenger, movement, church, then the Gentiles. Okay, so the testimony of two is a thing established. That's God's order of things. So, now, <clears throat> what I want to do is look at what the, what the test is. The test, this is the same test for everybody, right? And it says, this is from 15 MR 15, 1 to 3. It says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before preparation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. In Revelation 13, this subject is plainly presented. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. So, the test that the people of God must have is the image of the beast test right and once they've been passed through that test they've been sealed they can then go on and take it to the world this is what it tells about to the jew first and also to the gentiles so in order for him to get to this point he has to raise up a messenger which raise up a movement and the movement goes to the church the church goes through its test everybody from the messenger the movement and the church that goes through this test are sealed, then go to the Gentiles. That's the order. It's very, very simple. Okay, so um, let's, let's try to put this on our line here. Right. So we've just gone through this now. Let's just look at what... Once the people of God have been sealed in their forehead, let's look at what um, happens next. And in this quote that we're going to read, it explains why God has to do it this way. I mean, he could have used angels in heaven to do this work, but he's ordained it that the people on the earth will do this work, right? Now, I want us to understand something, that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Moses, uh, who were specially taken up to heaven early uh, for, for specific reasons 
came down to strengthen Christ before he went through the cross. And it's very clear why it was Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses had been on this earth, had suffered the effects of sin, had gone through the great controversy by the grace of Christ, and were now in heaven. They were able to come down and strengthen Christ. They were able to say, Lord, we've gone through this. We know that you can go through it. And they came to encourage him because if Christ failed, they would lose their place in heaven. Right? They're not in heaven on their own merits. They were only in the merits of Christ. Christ had to go to the cross. So it's teaching us something at the end of the world that it's not really the same for, for, a, for an angel that's never gone through this experience on earth to come to you to help you through the plan of salvation when they don't really know what you're going through. Therefore, God wants to, first of all, use people in heaven who've gone through that experience, who come to God's people and strengthen them, help them to get through their test. Then God's people who've also gone through the test will go through and help there are other people through the test, like the Gentiles. This is how God ordains it, right? And it says here in this next quote, from 15 letters and manuscripts, letter 12, 1900, paragraph 12 and 13. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convince the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. The world can only be warned by seeing those who believe the truth, sanctified through the truth, acting upon high and holy principles, showing in a high elevated sense the line of demarcation between those who keep the commandments of God and those who trample them under their feet. So here it says that the world can only be saved by seeing people who are holy, right? Who, who show the line of demarcation between those that keep God's law and those that don't. That's how the world is going to be won. They're going to be, be won by seeing holy people preach a message to them. Not unholy people that come and say, we need you to be a Christian, you need to change your life, when their own lives are full of sin and, and lots of other terrible things. No wonder so many people in the world think Christians are such hypocrites. It says, the sanctification of the Spirit signalizes the difference between those who have the seal of God and those who keep his spurious rest day. So we, we, we read that it, God's people, the test for God's people was the image of the beast test. And you can't be sealed until you've gone through that. And here, the world can only be won by those who are holy and who have the seal, right? So only after you've gone through the image of the beast test, which is the Sunday law crisis, and then you're holy, can you then go to the world and take them through their test. The sanctification of the Spirit signalizes the difference between those who have the seal of God and those who keep his spirit's rest day. When the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It is the keeping of Sunday. Those who, after having heard the truth, continue to regard this day as holy, bear the signature of the man of sin, who thought to change times and laws. And <clears throat> so, uh, very clear, those that stand through the test, receive the seal of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, they will go forth to the world. And this says the world can only be won seeing these people. Right? This is why God does it in this order. And it goes on to say in Evangelism 234, no one has yet received the mark of the beast. The testing time has not yet come. We just read the testing time is the image of the beast test, which is the Sunday law. There are true Christians in every church, not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have had the light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. So once God's people have gone through their test, received the seal of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and bring forward this message, and the Gentiles now know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Now they can be held accountable. 
Now they are going to take their choice. And this is how the whole world is going to be brought to take a stand for God by keeping his commandments, by the controversy over Sabbath and Sunday issue. And it's broken down into these, these two parts. And we will see this clearer and clearer as we go through. Okay, so um, now remember this was on, on Moses' line, right? And this is also parallel in our line here. So 1989, time at the end. 1989, 1798 were the two parts of Daniel 1140 that typify the time and typify the Sunday law. And 2014 also typifies the Sunday law in the sense that we had a separation take place here, marking the first temple cleansing, and there's going to be a separation at the end. And Sister White parallels the first temple cleansing and the second temple cleansing with the two voices in Revelation 18. Revelation 18, 1 to 3, Revelation 8, 4 and 5. And Revelation 18, 1 to 3, Sister White says very clearly, marks the Sunday law crisis. So these two way marks are typifying the Sunday law. They're only types. There's no Sunday law in our time. But when you take this line, what you do is we see that you have a messenger raised up. Now this messenger was also paralleled by Christ because you had John, then you had Christ coming here to be baptized. Now I want us to understand that in the Millerite history, you, you had Miller, right? And, and, and Miller was the messenger that, that was used. And he was also the Elijah message and he, he went through here, right? Miller gave both the first and, uh, well, he gave the first angel's message. Christ and John is just showing you a different illustration of the same thing. John's the messenger raised up and Christ represents all the people that would have received the message of John and are sanctified here and filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So what I want you to see is this is just a parallel of the Sunday law crisis. Here you would have the Sunday law coming, right? The, the final warning going. And now when Christ came to be baptized, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, signifying those that get the seal of God in their forehead. So it's just a type of the Sunday law crisis, just showing you some elements of what will take place. And we have to bring all those things together line upon line. So... What you have here is a messenger raised up in the time of Christ. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Christ, the anointed one, then goes and gathers a movement. And that movement then gets tested in this time period, leading down to the cross, right, where Christ says, your house is left unto you desolate. Close of probation for, in, in that light. That's what it was typified, right? Okay, more can be said about that in other illustrations. But Christ now, when he got here, he had a people. Now, so what I want you to see is this is just a repeat of this, but on a higher level. Here you have a messenger. Here you have a group of messengers. Because right here at the midnight cry, uh, at the triumphal entry, you had a group of people singing, Sister White parallels it to the midnight cry. So just like you have a, one messenger crying in the wilderness right here, you have a group of people now crying in the wilderness. So what I want to do is show you that, that this was just typified by this. So what we want to do is we're going to take this, which also typifies the Sunday law, and we're going to bring it down here. Right? So I'm just going to do this. 2014. Um, Increase of knowledge comes. The midnight cry there represents this messenger or this group of messengers that's raised up right here to now uh, preach. And, and remember in uh, Millerite history, this marked a prediction that was given that got confirmed right here, prefiguring 9 11, right? So it's telling us that in our time there's going to be a prediction in here going to confirm this way map because we're now seeing line upon line. So when it's in this part of the line, it's the last test for a people who he's raising up here. But when it's on this part of the line, it now represents simultaneously a message being given for this next group of people. Just like the messenger raised up 
was to raise up a movement that were going to be tested here. So whilst they're being tested there, they're also given a message that's raising up a people that are going to be tested here. And this people that would be tested would then be the church because it goes from the messenger to the movement, from the movement to the church, right? So the church has to go through the Sunday law first. Now, I'm just going to put FR here, and FR stands for final review. Now, we're not going to go into that in this, but the final review is where you stand before and receive your, uh, basically whether you've made it or not. The, the books are open, and that happens in heaven, you don't know it, but one class gets cast out, one class gets filled with the Spirit, and that's marking the end, but we're not going to deal with that, I'm just marking it there, right? So, and same principle. Once the church goes through its test, right, you have a separation take place here, you have a larger group out of the church then raised up, right, as the messenger to go to the Gentiles. So you bring that down here, and that's what we have here, right? When the, the Lord gets here, he has this group, they come to their final review at the end and prefigured by Christ at the baptism, they get now filled with the Holy Spirit. Christ did not receive a measure of the Spirit, he received a full outpouring. And once they got this full outpouring, they now go and minister to the Gentiles. This is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, the Lord says, tarry in the house, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And they've tarried now and now they get the power right here and they go forward to the Gentiles. So this is a fulfillment of the final reform line, right? It takes you down to the final review for the, the Gentiles, which is also the clause of probation where the seven last plagues pour out. But we'll talk more about that as we go through. So the point that I want you to get from this is the order of events. Now we still got to deal with this way, Mark, and we will deal with that in a moment. But I just want you to see that this is how the Lord is going to fulfill the last day events in this order. Messenger, past tense, because it's done now. Movement, we're going to finish off this movement very shortly. We're just before this point. So it's about to be a separation takes place and he will have a people that will get a measure of the Spirit right here, okay, and they will go forward and guide the church down through the same experience that they went through, right? They'll guide them through this step by step until the church gets filled with the, the Spirit and then they will go forward and they will guide the Gentiles through until the Lord says it is finished. So that's the order of events, right? That's what all those reform lines in the past were. And you can see line upon line, they teach exactly the same thing, the order of events. And it really was prefiguring these two phases of the Sunday law, first for the Jew, then for the Gentiles. Now let's show this. Let's now go to October 22nd, 1844, which is lining up right here, right? October 22nd was the closed door in the Millerite history, and parallel to the Passover and the cross, and this way map right here. So what happened? This is from early writings, um, <clears throat> page 42. It says, I saw that Jesus had shut the door of the holy place, and no man can open it, and that he had opened the door into the most holy, and no man can shut it. And that since Jesus has opened the door into the most holy place which contains the ark, the commandments have been shining out to God's people and they have been tested on the Sabbath question. So on October 22nd, 1844, right, this way mark, they began to be tested on the Sabbath. Now, if we just bring that uh, down here, right, it's marking the, the Sabbath test begins here. Now we know the Sunday law is here, right? So the something, when you understand this, the something that 
test you on the Sabbath question before you get to the Sunday law. So let's, let's look at that, right? Next paragraph says, I saw that the present test on the Sabbath could not come until the mediation of Jesus in the holy place was finished and he had passed within the second veil. Therefore, Christians who fell asleep before the door was opened into the Most Holy when the midnight cry was finished at the seventh month, AD 44, and who have not kept the true Sabbath now rest in hope, for they had not the light and the test on the Sabbath which we now have since that door was opened. So everybody that fell asleep before October 22nd that was faithful to the light that they had has not been judged on the Sabbath, because Sabbath had been demolished by Satan in past history for over a thousand years and there were very few Christians that were still observing the Sabbath so many of them were brought up as Christians knowing nothing about the Sabbath not understanding it so the Lord was not holding them accountable but since 1844 that light on the Sabbath came to his church and they were now being tested on it okay um, so in 1844 the Sabbath test began. And it's interesting because in 1846, it says, in the autumn of 1846, we began to observe the Bible Sabbath and to teach it and defend it. So 1844, they begin to be tested on the Sabbath. That truth begins to be agitated. 1846, Sister White and her husband James and many others around her began to keep the Sabbath of the Bible. And it says here in CET 86.1, when the foundations of the earth were laid, then was also laid the foundation of the Sabbath. Now it's very interesting because let's just take, because 1844 is a parallel to this, right, which would be a parallel to this. So I'm going to write here 1844, right, just as a symbol. October 22nd, right? They began to be tested on the Sabbath truth. And then in 1846, it says that they began, they, they began now to keep the Sabbath. And it says that the Sabbath is the foundation. Now, if you go back line upon line, now remember you have 2007, you have these two tables. 43 chart and the 50 get rediscovered. Now, much we can say about those two charts, those two charts are a prophetic illustration of the two tables of stone, right? So, two tables of stone, which is the law of God, are illustrated in these two charts, right? And it's the foundation, right? Sister White says that these charts that were made from Habakkuk was the foundation of their faith. It was the rock of ages. And... Here it's saying that the Sabbath was the foundation. So I want to write 1846. You're just not literally, spiritually, marking the foundation. And this is what was laid in all these histories and the, the three decrees. It's where they laid the foundation before they began to build the temple. Whenever the foundation was laid, the enemies always began to begin their work. So, the next thing that comes is the year 1848, right? So I'm going to put 1848 here, and I'm going to show you how it represents the Sunday law. So 1844, they begin to be tested on the Sabbath question. 1846, they begin to keep the Sabbath, which is the foundation. And 1848, the Sunday law comes, right? So we're, we're just laying out Millerite history, which we're adding on to the end of our history, because that history is teaching us about what's going to happen here, right? And then we'll go back in history and we'll understand more. So 1848, this quote is from Early Writings 85. It says, this view was given in 1847. Okay, shortly before 1848, she has a vision. When there were but very few of the Advent brethren observing the Sabbath, and of these, but few suppose that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now we already read about this line, this line, the separating line between those that keep the commandments of God and those that don't. And she's saying in 1847, few of us were keeping the Sabbath and we didn't know that it was going to be this line that was going to separate us from 
God's people and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble, here mentioned, does not refer to the time when the plagues shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. Now remember, the third angel is just a repeat of Millerite history, the first and second angel's messages. You want us to understand that. So, 1848 says, she says in 1847, we can see it right before us, and we're going to show you that it's 1848 she's talking about. And it says, the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. So the third angel in 1848 was beginning to manifest itself. It's just a type, and we'll see that. So let's look at what happened on 1848, this what she saw. It says, on the 21st day of February, <coughs> 1848, when the courtiers of Louis Philippe of France. Now Louis also is another name for Clovis. Now remember, Clovis was the one that put the papacy on the throne. He was responsible for bringing all the nations together and ultimately this is what ended up placing the Pope on the throne in 538. So Louis Philippe of France were gathered around him and he said, I was never more firmly seated on the throne of empire than I am tonight. In the twilight of the next evening, wearing a pea jacket, disguised as a hackney coachman, he fled outside the walls of the city of Paris, seeking a refuge for his personal safety. The cause of this great and sudden change is said to have been the result of some movement on his part, favouring the papal usurpation, which offended his subjects and his soldiers. So, a, there was a papal usurpation. And basically, the king of France, plus many of the kings of Europe, he gathered them together to France, and they were looking to put the Pope back on the throne. They were looking to heal the deadly wound. And when they heal the deadly wound, Sunday law uh, begins. This is what we were looking at with the past, the present, and the future. The past was 538 to 1798, pointing forward to the future when that history would be fulfilled when the deadly wound would be healed. So here in 1848 is typifying that event. Um, he had on that day completed in the city of Paris a grand military review of the French army. And when their arms were stacked, he retired to the palace when suddenly a small boy jumped upon a cannon, waving a trickler flag, crying, down with the Pope, down with the Pope. The soldiers taking up the cry it passed swiftly up and down the lines, gaining strength as it went, until connected with it was the cry, and down with the king. In a few hours, all Paris was a scene of wild confusion. So you see that down with the Pope, down with the king. There you have church and state. The soldiers with guns in hand, accompanied by a mob, were rushing for the king's palace. He, on being informed of the turmoil, hastened to escape under disguise. Now remember... We're putting 1848 there, right, marking that. And this comes down here. It's also typifying this event right here, this Sunday law. Now what you see here, right, is in 1848, the king of the south, France, coming against the king of the north. The king and his, his the, the ten kings, basically, all these leaders with their, their, their you know, the political system that is in place. But the people of that system, they rise up. So you have the south rising against the north. That's Daniel 11, 40, which is marking here, right? So you see how Daniel 11, 40 typifies the Sunday law crisis, when the south comes against the north, but the north's going to retaliate, right? But you, you see that taking place there in 1848. And Sister White writes about it. In fact, we'll just read this last paragraph before we go there. And she goes on, to, or um, in the book Great Second Advent Movement, he goes on to say, The commotion and unrest of France spread rapidly to other countries. Prussia, Hanover, Sardinia, Sicily, Naples, Venice, Lombardy, Tuscany, and Rome. 
So if you include France, you've got 10 nations there. The history and progress are in agreement. So we know that these 10 nations typify these 10 kings at the end of the world. It's just a symbol. Caught the same mob spirit. Within three months, all Europe was astir, and over 30 empires and kingdoms were in the greatest disorder. Thrones were burned in the streets. Kings and emperors were fleeing and hiding for fear of losing their lives. Politicians predicted that there would be a general revolution of the governments of the world. So Sister White now is going to write about 1848, and she's going to tell us what it represents. December 16th, 1848. This is taken from Christian Experience and Teachings, page 111. December 16th, 1848. The Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. I saw that when the Lord said heaven, in giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he meant heaven. And when he said earth, he meant earth. The powers of heaven are the sun, moon, and stars. They rule in the heavens. The powers of earth are those that rule on the earth. The powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. Then the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken, and that events come in order. War and rumours of war, sword, famine and pestilence are the first to shake the powers of the earth. Then the voice of God will shake the sun, the moon and stars of the earth also. So she takes this from Matthew 24. She's saying that 1848 was typified or typifying this, what, taken, what was marked in Matthew chapter 24, wars and rumours of wars. I saw that the shaking of the powers in Europe is not, as some teach, the shaking of the powers of heaven, but it is the shaking of the angry nations. So, when they make a Sunday law, it's telling us that the nations are going to get angry, marking this point right here. We'll come more into that. We'll show these things very clearly, what, what they illustrate and help us to understand as we, we build this picture more and more. So all we've done is we've come to the end of our line to understand this way, Mark, to Mark. There's a Sabbath test here. Let me just take it down here. So that was here on October 22nd. So just let me... I, I, I won't write any 44 here. So we have it here. October 22nd, which parallels this way, Mark. There was a test on the Sabbath. Foundation was laid. Sunday law began. That's what these three points are showing. However, we want to understand what, what is the thing that tests us on the Sabbath right here? What does it mark in our time? Well, in order to understand that, let's go to Great Controversy 443. Excuse me, one more. It says, But what is the image to the beast? And how is it to be formed? Now we, we read that the, the test that the people of God must have is the image of the beast test. So she's going to talk about it here. But what is the image to the beast and how is it to be formed? The image is made by the two horned beast and is an image to the beast. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. So if you want to understand the image to the beast or the image of the beast, go back and look at the papacy. It says, when the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. So the church went to the secular power and says, ask them for help. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, because the United States the one who's going to make the image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state 
will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. So France typifies the United States, right? We looked at that. And so right here, this would mark this point where this two-horned power uh, makes this decree and, and, and sets it in place, the, the image of the beast test, the Sunday law test. But prior to that, God's people are being tested on the Sabbath in this time period. So we want to understand that more, and it's going to explain it to us. Let's read on. This is from Great Controversy 574. If the reader would understand the agencies to be employed in the soon coming contest, he has but to trace the record of the means which Rome employed for the same object in ages past. So there's no new thing at the end of the world. All things that will be have already been. So you've got to go back in history. History will show us what's going to come. If he would know how papists and Protestants united will deal with those who reject their dogmas, let him see the spirit which Rome manifested toward the Sabbath and its defenders. Royal edicts, general councils and church ordinances sustained by secular power were the steps by which the pagan festival attained its position of honour in the Christian world. This is talking about Sunday worship. This is how it came into light. The first public measure enforcing Sunday observance was the law enacted by Constantine in AD 321. This edict required townspeople to rest on the venerable day of the sun. So it was a day of rest. Now that's important because that day of rest is going to be brought back in at the end of the world. Um, but permitted countrymen to continue their agricultural pursuits. It says, though virtually a heathen statute, it was enforced by the emperor after his nominal acceptance of Christianity. So what you had here is you had a law that was made that the Sunday had to be honoured. People were not to work on Sunday. It was to be made a day of rest. But farmers and so on and so forth, they could still work. And nobody was being forced to break the Sabbath, right? That's not the Sunday law. The Sunday law of Bible prophecy is when God's people are not only forced to honour Sunday, but they're also forced to break the Sabbath. Yet this law, made by Constantine in the past, was the first law in regards to Sunday in 321. But this law was a civil law. It was a law that required people to honour Sunday as a day of rest, apart from farmers and necessary people, they could still work, right? And nobody was being forced to disregard the biblical Sabbath. It says, goes on to say, as the papacy became firmly established, the work of Sunday exaltation was continued. For a time, the people engaged in agricultural labor when not attending church, and the seventh day was still regarded as the Sabbath. But steadily, a change was effected. Those in holy office were forbidden to pass judgment in any civil controversy on the Sunday. Soon after, all persons of whatever rank were commanded to refrain from common labor on pain of a fine for freemen and stripes in the case of servants. Later it was decreed that rich men should be punished with the loss of half of their estates and finally that if still obstinate they should be made slaves. The lower classes were to suffer perpetual banishment. The decrees of councils Proving insufficient, the secular authorities were besought to issue an edict that would strike terror to the hearts of the people and force them to refrain from labour on the Sunday. At a synod held in Rome, all previous decisions were reaffirmed with greater force and solemnity. They were also incorporated into the ecclesiastical law and enforced by the civil authorities throughout nearly all Christendom. So what happened? They first of all made this civil Sunday law where people were still allowed to worship on Sabbath and the, the workers could still work in their fields, etc., etc. But as it went forward, those things became smaller and smaller. They brought more and more restrictions, causing people to stop working. And eventually, it's going to lead down to this point where they're also going to 
prevent you from worshipping on the Sabbath. Let's read on. This is from Great Controversy, page 52. To prepare the way for the work which he designed to accomplish, Satan had led the Jews before the advent of Christ to load down the Sabbath with the most rigorous exactions, making its observance a burden. Now taking advantage of the false light in which he had thus caused it to be regarded, he cast contempt upon it as a Jewish institution. While Christians generally continued to observe the Sunday as a joyous festival, he led them in order to show their hatred of Judaism, Judaism to make the Sabbath a fast, a day of sadness and gloom. In the early part of the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. So this was the Civil Sunday Law. The Day of the Sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects and was honoured by Christians. It was the Emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism and Christianity. So they were trying to unite pagans and Christians alike together, so therefore they brought Sunday in and pushing away the Jewish Sabbath. They were taking Sunday, they were putting a new covering over it as if it was a holy day, which the pagans would happily accept and Christians would also honour. This was what they were trying to do. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church, who, inspired by ambition and thirst for power, perceived that if the same day was observed by both Christians and heathen, it would promote the nominal acceptance of Christianity by pagans and thus advance the power and glory of the church. But while many God-fearing Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord and observed it in obedience to the fourth commandment. The arch deceiver had not completed his work. He was resolved to gather the Christian world under his banner and to exercise his power through his vice gearing the proud pontiff who claimed to be the representative of Christ. Through half-converted pagans, ambitious prelates and world-loving churchmen, he accomplished his purpose. Vast councils were held from time to time in which the dignitaries of the church were convened from all the world. In nearly every council, the Sabbath which God had instituted was pressed down a little lower, while the Sunday was correspondingly exalted. Thus the pagan festival came finally to be honoured as a divine institution, while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were declared to be a curse. So, um, last point I'm going to read about this was from Jane Andrews. You can see that we see the same thing. Makes the civil uh, decree in 321, and more and more it works its way forward that the Sabbath is becoming less and less and less. I'm going to reach this point where it's completely disregarded. And this is what we're going to read here. This is from Jane Andrews. It was Constantine the Great who first made a law for the proper observance of Sunday, and who, according to Eusebius, appointed, uh, appointed it should be regularly celebrated throughout the Roman Empire. Before him, and even in his time, they observed the Jewish Sabbath as well as Sunday, both to satisfy the law of Moses and to imitate the apostles who used to meet together on the first day by Constantine's law promulgated in 321. It was decreed that for the future, the Sunday should be kept as a day of rest in all cities and towns, but he allowed the country people to follow their work. When the practice of keeping Saturday Sabbaths, which had become so general at the close of this century, was evidently gaining ground in the Eastern Church, a decree was passed in the council held at Laodicea, 364, that members of the church should not rest from work on the Sabbath like the Jews, but should labor on that day and preferring in honor the Lord's day, then if it be in their power, should rest from work as Christians. The seventh day Sabbath was solemnized by Christ, the apostles and primitive Christians, till the Laodicean council did in a manner quite abolish the observation of it. The Council of Laodicea, AD 364, 
first set of the observation of the Lord's Day and prohibited the keeping of the Jewish Sabbath under an anathema. So they've reached that point. It was the, first of all, they have this civil law. This is what it begins with. It begins with a civil law. And as the civil law is going forward, the Sabbath, they're trying to press the Sabbath down. But what really happened was more people began to keep it. And they were so mad because they were trying to get rid of this Jewish Sabbath and exalt Sunday when more people began acknowledging the, 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 the seventh day of the week, the true Sabbath, they finally came to this decree of Laodicea and they anathemized anybody who, who kept it. So the Council of Laodicea was really typifying the point where the Sunday law comes in because no at this point, you're, you're no longer uh, allowed uh, to keep the Sabbath and just refrain from work on their day, their Sunday, that they've uh, advocated as a civil law. But now you also have to refrain from worshipping and resting on the Sabbath. This marks the Sunday law crisis. So when you understand that, you have these two points. You have a civil Sunday law leading to the Sunday law. Okay, and... History shows these points. So ultimately, what we are waiting for is a civil law that's going to come about here because of an event that takes place. There's an event, and we'll look at that event as we go through. Right? Remember, when we bring this down here, we we'll line this up with Millerite history, August 11, 1849-11, there was a Islam was restrained. Islam was restrained, but also, first of all, loosed, brought down those buildings, right? And in 9-11, they made a law, and it was a civil law they made, and it was called the Patriot Act. And this, this terrible civil law that they made was a preparation for the Sunday law. And so what you have right here is that the, um, the Patriot Act which is a civil law, was already preparing the way for the abolishment of the, the other forms of religion, specifically the Sabbath, because in that Patriot Act, there are some terrible restrictive things on people, uh, especially on, they call them religious fanatics, right? People who want to uphold their own faith, they call them religious fanatics. And, you know, well, if you see what happened at 9-11, all the churches came together, right? It was exactly what was happening here in the time of Constantine. He was trying to bring the world and the churches together as one. And many people from the world went into those churches, never been a church in their life, but they went in there and they were all coming together. And they were all Sunday keeping churches, right? So what happened in the past was being prefigured right here by this event. And it was all done in... Millerite history on August 11, 1840 by prediction. So a prediction will be made when the event comes to pass, cause and effect. It will have an effect and the effect will be the Sunday law because the Patriot Act was the law that they put in place in result of this event. So that's what we are looking for, right? And that's the point that we need to see. Okay, so um, I'll finish with those thoughts. So all the reform lines pointed to the end of the world. And when you understand the order of events and how God is the same yesterday, today and forever and is dealing with man is ever the same, you can see how these tests raising up of a messenger Raising up of a movement, raising up of a church, leading to the raising up of or the taking the message to the Gentiles, which was the commission given by Christ before he left this earth, right? And they had to tarry and wait for the power from on high, and that's going to be given right here, prefigured by Christ's baptism when he went forth to do that work. So <clears throat> I want us to understand that line upon line it gives you a perfect illustration based upon all the principles in the Bible 
of how things are going to be done, all based upon the seven thunders, as we see right here from the Sunday law, which is the time of the end, all the way down to the closed door, all based upon the seven thunders in Millerite history and all the other lines. So I hope that this is a blessing. Please study these things out for yourself and let us close in prayer until we come for our next presentation. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your great blessings and I want to um, ask and pray, Lord, that you would really uh, open the hearts of many people with these things, that they would have their eyes open, they would really see that the Bible is not just some book that is set on a shelf and gather dust, it's the most intricate, most powerful book that's ever been written, it's packed full of truth and jewels that will open the mind and will inspire people to change their lives drastically and to prepare for these terrible events that are about to come. And I pray, Lord, that this uh, illustration here would inspire and convict many people to awaken themselves and to seek you while you may be found, while they still have time. And I just want to thank you for your great love for all of us. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.